but uh, here we have a Bloody Maru. So, um, for the record, I hate Bloody Marys with passion. <laughs> um, we once got a Bloody Mary that had like everything you could imagine, including a lobster tail, just because, you know, you kind of couldn't not get something like that. So we ate all the food and left most of the Bloody Mary. So I'm not enthusiastic, <laughs> but here goes. You told me it wouldn't be quite as bad. Right there, you know, that's our measure of success. I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> of the vampire of Melrose Abbey in Scotland? Yes, I have. Um, I saw it. I believe I saw it on Amazon Prime on some show, some documentary, some little really? show. Yeah. Okay. It's just to recap for our, what are we up to? 8.7 million listeners. Uh, yeah, we grew a couple hundred thousand yeah. in the last couple of years. Yeah, months. we did. Our last guest was good. So <laughs> you better do better. <laughs> <laughs> No pressure, though. Um, yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those drinks you're making there. Really um, here, can we, uh, technology yeah. isn't that advanced yeah. yet, is it? Um, we'll send you the recipe. It's That second one is really good. Um, so for our 8.7 million listeners, which is a scientifically deduced number, um, the, the Vampire of Melrose Abbey was told, do you happen to remember, I think, the 1200s? is when this story is from 1100s maybe melrose abbey was fairly new at the time and there is um one of the histories of scotland they recorded this and the monks told them this is what happened and there were originally four monks who were watching he was called the hund press the the dog priest because he was not living a very moral life he was chasing women and wine and drink and song and um and it's these these priests tell how they watched the grave and this man came up from the grave and kept coming up from the grave and walking around and in your next reading you will call yourself a man of science what do you and you've said you're a christian as both a man of faith and a man of science what do you make of a story like this that tells us something we don't believe in modern days and yet it's being told by these priests who have everything to lose by lying. You know, it's, I believe, and as this is, this is just my humble opinion, and I hope folks don't start to go, ah, oh, he's one of those tinfoil hatters. Mm -hmm. I believe a lot has been withheld from us. I believe there's a lot of truths that are about to come out. And I, as Negan on Walking Dead says, people better be ready to put on their pee-pee pants. I think... There's a lot of stuff that has definitely been held out throughout the ages. I believe there's a significant influence of power by a very, very, very select few that determine what goes into the media and what people should believe and what they shouldn't believe. And I think at the end of the day as a Christian, I think when you put God first and foremost in your life, he always promises one thing. When you ask him for wisdom, he will show you. You will pull the scales back from your eyes and you'll see stuff. And for me, that's been a, a lot for me to see through people, see through things. And I think, you know, as a criminal psychologist, as a psychologist, I need to. I was a person that could be a human lie detector. So I read people. So I had quite say I read it, but I aspired to read it. Some people believe that ghosts are like Polaroids, that it's just energy that's replaying itself over and over in a film. So it's like it, people will see it, but you can't interact with it. You'll see this thing moving, okay? Mm -hmm. I believe that there's a uh, universe, the universal ether or whatever, it, there's a, res a residual effect that's left, and you can kind of see it much like you would a camera projection. Mm -hmm. And the folks that I've spoken with that have seen that, and by the way, I've never seen that per se, they would say, I'd ask them, can you communicate with that entity? And it's like, no. It's like, you try it, it's like, no. 
it's like, but then again, I, spar, I, I speak to my husband and I get the same response. So <laughs> <laughs> we're still in the honeymoon. He still answers me. <laughs> well, having you plan on that, being in the honeymoon for the next 50 years. Yes, so, right. so. <laughs> I will go to the other side of the coin. I have actually sat there and it was not my choice. It was the last thing I ever wanted to see. I once went to a church event and I only wanted to go there for the pie, a piece of apple cobbler pie or apple crumble pie, whatever it was in a coffee. And so I I knew the, the British minister, he came from England. He was a former uh, detective, homicide detective who became a pastor here in Canada, came over and I just wanted to go visit with him. And so I went, I caught the end of the service, and at the end of the service, they were doing a call up, and I watched what, and you know, I saw demon, I saw demonic possession, no doubt about it. It took twelve. I'm sorry, minutes. you saw what? This person that was possessed, for a okay. better word. The eyes were rolling in a socket. He was foaming, and he was speaking Arabic and other stuff. And this guy was no more than twenty-one years old. Who, wow. And it took twelve people to hold him down. And I got invited to be the 12th person to come hold this mm. it down, so to speak. And what I saw was absolutely, it was horrific. The way, the, 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 what the kid was saying and mm -hmm. how he was saying it and how he looked. Fast forward, and this was probably the kicker for me finishing with the TV series. We were filming in an old B&B. In that old B&B, we had found out there had been a hanging, somebody had committed suicide. And when the people had bought this historical 200-year-old amazing building eventually repair people would not set foot in the house they then stripped down the upper level and they found pentagrams on the floor and a lot of demonic stuff mm -hmm. we were filming in the house there was 12 of us i was directing that day and we usually used to bring a guest investigator in so i had a former high-ranking member of the canadian army he's a captain he came to be our guest investigator during that, we watched the owner's husband start to have an apparent heart attack. That whatever it was, a shadow figure, and I did see this thing go up the wall and disappear. After I heard a disembodied voice, which myself and 12 other people, including skeptics, heard build the room. And to this day, I saved it. I have it on tape. Mm -hmm. And it was after that uh, event, Laura, I had went home. I felt like something was watching me all night in my doorway of my bedroom. I couldn't sleep. It was the most restless sleep I had in my life other than when I fell sick with a, a flu or a cold. We touched base the next day because people reached out and said, did anybody else feel haunted or spooked that night and feel like somebody was watching them? Almost everybody said something followed them home. From that point in, I was done. I, I, I said, I, I'm doing this for history and I'm doing uh -huh. it for the camaraderie and the fun. But when it gets to that point, and I watched evil happen in that area, yes, for whatever reason, and thank gosh, one of the individuals that quote unquote is the psychic medium is a nurse. That's her full time job. Mm -hmm. She tended to this person and said, "Yeah, he was having the onset of a potential heart attack." And this thing, and there was three psych, two, two or three psychic mediums there. They all said this thing, this shadow figure, which is a demonic entity, attacked mm -hmm. them, and that's where I said, "Exit stage left." I base things on logic. I even base my views on logic. I don't know if that's a good or thing or bad thing, but I do. I can tell you logically why I believe the Christian faith and why I believe what I do. And that plays into this whole question of ghosts because my feeling is I, I don't want to say I believe in ghosts. Emotionally, I do not want to say that. Like, oh, come on, you know, it's just stories. And yet, the logical part of my brain says there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of ghost stories over the centuries going back. They didn't all make it up. So I wanted to tell you this story. This is a candle. <laughs> this is a candle that did not exist in our lives until it did. So we moved into a house in Duluth, and it's just a really, it was a really amazing house. Um, if anybody would like to buy it, it's for sale, um, and you should really make us an offer. Um, but 
when we moved into this house, and it's fairly modern, you know, the, the house itself was a little house built up on a hill on like 29, 30 acres backing up to a state park. So it's very kind of remote. And then the previous owners, uh, he was restaurateur in Duluth and he built all these amazing restaurants and he could do whatever he wanted. So he did and he built this amazing addition. But unfortunately, he, um, he had a lot of health issues. He had had one organ transplant, he needed another and he died relatively young. From everything I know, he had quite a sense of humor. And in fact, I went to school with his youngest brother. So we had lived in the house about eight months. And all of a sudden, this was sitting on our mantelpiece. And our mantelpiece was bare. There's no way we missed this. Hmm. Um, within the first few days we moved there, our box of wine and our Irish cream disappeared. <laughs> so we always blame that on our ghost. Um, and like I said, if, if it's the previous owner, I think he had a sense of humor from everything I know of him. And it's like, that is exactly what he would do. And at the same time, we're like, Brian, <laughs> give our Irish cream back. That's so <laughs> pricey. Exactly. Um, Especially now. So, right. Yeah. So then one day a pair of readers like glasses just appeared on our counter and we had had people in the house, but we asked everyone and they all said, I have no clue what you're talking about. And then in our shower, we had like a kind of a band mosaic and it was missing one little tile. And this was maybe a year and a half after we moved into the house, I had this fantastic walk-in closet and I always kept it very neat and clean, all the countertops completely bare. One day I walked in there and there is this little tile from the shower. Mm -hmm. sitting on my counter you know like how does that happen that's impossible um you know he didn't put it there i didn't put it there mm -hmm. and nobody else was in the house and this tile missing from the shower was just there